Joe, I'm assuming that based on everything that we've talked about recently that this is our annual anime episode. That's correct, Mark. We've we've waded into season three far enough where we've we've lulled in our viewers with the false sense of security that we would not be doing what we typically do, but then we hit them with anime. I don't know if this is everyone's stick. I enjoy it. But here we are with Joe's annual anime episode. Yeah, you know, it's almost like I was lulled into a false sense of security myself. <laughs> as, as those of you who have been listening to this program since day one, I didn't have a whole lot of anime experience growing up. Mm -mm. It's, it's one of those areas of nerddom that just nobody in my family nor my immediate friend groups ever got into. Yep. But I mean, that that changed a little bit, didn't it? I mean, you I think I think it it changed for most of us just because of anime's availability in the West. Uh we 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 took this this um this genre of animation uh and it went from basically like the earliest of the early Saturday morning cartoons where you had to wake up at 4:30 in the morning to catch back-to-back -back anime shows and then we went to the standard you know programming for saturday morning and then it eventually caught on a little bit more where we got into toonami and even then toonami like uh with um on cartoon network that that even then like was mostly when it first came out mostly non-anime you you'd pepper in like your sailor moon and your ronin warriors and then after that you'd get like you know max fleischer superman and you would get uh, a few other things that moltar would host and then it of course like would go further and further and become more progressive but now we've we've hit um a time in the west where anime is not only available, but I would I would argue very widely accepted. Um, you would argue it was widely accepted, and now it is. I would I would oh, argue. Oh, now no, okay. Yeah, now no, no, no. I I definitely didn't tell many people in high school I watched anime. Um, this this was definitely the the way of the millennial. Um, that it was something you didn't do because if you had to make the argument that in Japan adults watch anime, no one believed you, and if they did, they didn't care. Because this was America, uh, and that that's just how it was growing up. So I would have to, uh, like you know, go to like literally an hour away to a large enough video store to see what anime VHS was available. Um, <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's, mm -hmm. like, it's like trying to buy porn at the old rental store. You got you got to go past the go over the railroad tracks. <laughs> <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and, and like, oh and just as the city lights begin to dim, mm -hmm. you're almost there. <laughs> yep, and you still get kind of an odd look from the person behind the, the counter when you bring the VHS up of the anime because, like, you, like, you're in your teens, and instead of being like, you know, you're too young to buy this, it is now, aren't you too old to be buying cartoons? And that's basically yeah. what I had to, <laughs> what I had to go through. Um, but thankfully, my shame was only like, you know. It only happened every once in a while, and it was an hour away from where I lived. Uh, <laughs> so it was, it was pretty safe. But um, getting to what we have today uh, for our entry into the anime episode of the season is one that is actually pretty near and dear to me. Um, Gundam was probably the one that was the, is still probably like the biggest like anime series that I will kind of always be in love with. Um, but this is one that I was actually introduced to before Gundam. Uh, and I was introduced to it, believe it or not, by live action American movies. Uh, it's part of a, I would say ongoing, but the, the manga has become a hiatus. Uh, it is something that it was described as being, uh, techno organic armor, or as the series calls it, the originally the bio booster armor, because today we are talking about Giver. The bio. Boosted Booster. armor. <laughs> Specifically yeah. the bio-boosted armor, yes. You see, now, this is, this is part of the naming conventions that I always love when it comes to anime that I feel like they mm -hmm. weren't quite sure what was going to stick and what, what wasn't. <laughs> so it's like, you know what? Let's, let's start adding words here, guys. What's, what's, what's mm -hmm. going to work out? You know, obviously the, the uh, Japanese boardrooms that always have Italian people in them for some reason or Northeasterners. 
<laughs> but, <laughs> mm-hmm. but so okay, so when I when I think about the anime knowledge that I do have, or the animes, is that you know how people call it Pokemans? Is that is animes? Is that is that an offensive term? I mean, it's probably not offensive, but confounding to mm. some. As okay. I don't, I don't think this is like. I mean, it's it's not like how the British just add an S to yogurt. <laughs> it's or it's, add, it's, add a U in flavor. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, but okay. So, so for me, Joe, mm-hmm. I got to ask a question about this because I've haven't watched a whole lot of Attack on Titan, but I can mm-hmm. recognize stuff from Attack on Titan. Oh yes, I, I've not watch an extensive amount of Dragon Ball Z, Mm -hmm. but I can tell you, yeah, that's Dragon Ball Z. Mm -hmm. That guy that's been screaming for 45 minutes with commercial breaks, that's that's most likely a a Super Saiyan thing. Okay, Mm -hmm. got that down. Yes. But for most people, would they be able to look at Guyver and go, I know what that is? I would actually argue probably not, which is... And I'm not going to say surprising, because this is something, it's, it has been going on for a while. It is, uh, I believe, older than Dragon Ball Z, or it's, a, it's older than Dragon Ball Z. I think it came out around the same time Dragon Ball came out. So mm-hmm. it's as old as that series. Um, however, it is one where, while it has an intriguing enough story, it has cool enough designs going for it, uh, it's, its writing is just as good as any Dragon Ball that's out there, to be honest. It is one that has, for the most part, just kind of evaded the Western audience, Uh, Mm -hmm. which is not to say, like, through lack of trying, because this is something that uh, has been around for a long time. Uh, Guyver the Buyer Booster Armor came out in 1985 in in a publication called Shonen Captain as a manga. Uh, I believe it was a monthly serial by Yoshiki Takaya, and while yeah, Shonen Captain wouldn't stick around forever because, you know, print is dead and continuously dying. These publications fail, but stories get picked up. And it would go on to be actually produced all the way through 2016 and continued on for quite a while for a grand total of 32 volumes over three different publishers. But while most people in the West, if they have heard of Guyver, it would not be from the manga, as that is definitely one that... I never read, and to this day still have not read. But more than likely because of how many times this series has actually been adapted into something on screen. Um, like way back in 86, we got something that literally just covered like the first volume called Guyver Out of Control. It was a single OVA, so it was just a movie about an hour long. Um, then in uh, 89 to 92, we did get a anime series, and this is... Where I not where I started either, believe it or not. It was twelve episodes that was uh, basically a, ended pretty abruptly. Um in that I believe the funds just weren't there. And if you oh. watch the last six episodes, you will see that the funds were running dry <laughs> as the animation <laughs> takes a pretty, pretty sharp decline. <laughs> But where if anyone is going to have heard of this before, I think more than likely it came from the 1992 film called The Giver. It was live action. And if you did see it, you're also very confused because on the cover, you get a half face of what The Giver actually is, what the armor is. And the other half face is the very familiar, uh, very fantastic Mark Hamill, which mm-hmm. implies that Mark Hamill is going to be the Giver. He's going to be our main character throughout the story. But when you watch the movie, it turns out he's just a rough and gruff detective who's trying to get to the bottom of this whole thing oh, that's happening man. in the mean streets of L.A. and mm. is not the Giver himself, uh, which I think disappointed most audiences if they weren't confused by it. This seems mm-hmm. like a symptom of the time because it's just like when you went to go buy the first Mega Man game, right? And mm-hmm. you look at that box art and it's got this dude with like this like pastel colors and all this weird stuff just going on with him and he's holding a pistol. And then you get into that game and you're like, wait a second. Those bastards lied to me. And <laughs> that, that's that's kind of what Guyver felt like to me because I, I haven't like I didn't know a whole lot about Guyver until 
you like shocked this memory out mm-hmm. of me the other day where I went, oh my God, I remember this. And I thought it was yep. just like a false memory. <laughs> 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 if we're in the matrix, this, mm-hmm. this guy for like memory was placed there by the robots. I know it was. And <laughs> so then of course, when Joe, when he pitches the idea, not that we pitch ideas, like it's a, a boardroom thing here, but no one was thrown out a window uh, at that meeting, nor any of the other meetings that we have about the episodes that we make. Oh yeah, yeah. There's no board of directors. There's no. there's no there's no oversight. Mm-hmm. We're, we're just a couple of mavericks out here. But oh yeah, that's that's what I, I kind of think about this, Joe. Is that mm-hmm. Giver, from everything that I can tell, there's no found footage for me with this property. Like there, there's just none. At Missed all. opportunity. <laughs> really, really, I think that's how this should go because when we really get into the story on this, um, it's got, I mean, a lot of tropes, but I think it executes them very well of uh, this kind of overarching, um, like evil organization and uh, the the things that are running in the organization is like the perfect thing for found footage. Uh, but I mean, we got close to that in like the second live action Giver movie, uh, which yeah. actually starred David Hayter, by the way. Uh, if you don't recognize the name, I believe he was the writer and maybe even the director for the um, early 2000s shots at X-Men. So he he mm. took care of that one. He is also a voice in one of the Gundam series, the mini Gundam series, but I digress. You don't get into that. But in that movie, we did have like the, the 90s expose shows were prominent throughout uh, the beginning of that movie and kind of carried um, into the... Uh, the rest of it. But going into what we're looking at specifically, because we've talked about manga, OVAs, and live action movies, but specifically, we will be talking about the 26 anime series, Giver the Bio Boosted Armor, because they had to differentiate the name from the original uh, anime that came out. Uh, So this one longer so we get more story which is pretty nice but when mark was counting on this whole idea of found footage uh and how this could have been a missed opportunity is before we get into what the giver is itself let's talk a little about about what our hero is up against here i mentioned that there was this like clandestine like massive organization um which when you look at it looks like it is a bunch of crusty old people running it however beneath the crusty old people are basic foot soldiers. Um, And it turns out they have been genetically altered where they can transform into monsters. Uh, And they're quite vicious. Uh, And one thing that this series does, uh, as well as all of its predecessors, is it is known very much for its gore and violence. Uh, And that's something that uh, is nothing in any short uh, capacity or any small capacity in this anime series. Um, So we get this, uh, basically starting the series off with a character who has escaped Kronos, this evil organization, and he has with him three Giver units. Um, And Kronos desperately wants to get these back. He himself was in the middle of being transformed and wounded into these monsters, and can no longer survive outside of Kronos' help and is slowly dying. But mm. he is trying to get these units to someone who's kind of like a shadowy figure in the background, uh, which is where eventually we will meet our heroes of of the series. So, Mark, when you, um, I guess now that we're going to introduce like the actual heroes of the series uh, and like the Giver itself, um, obviously you had seen a little bit of like the uh the 80s movie and now we see the the cartoon uh what what is kind of your, like your take on like the overall like look and feel of of our hero here well i think between the hero and the show itself i just want to clarify mm-hmm. to people that i have never seen giver like this this animated show so right away when i start poking around and i'm trying to suss out what's going on here because Giver does something that's kind of rare for anime in that you have like a shadow organization that you're not really quite sure what to think of at first. There's there's warring factions. There's someone with a deep, dark secret that you just discover. And then suddenly we, we have teenagers that are thrust into the middle of it. Mm-hmm. And wait, are we talking about Gundam again? Or is this, <laughs> is this guy... 
I mean, I mean, this could also just be Transformers because I believe Optimus Prime once told a a, a teenager that fate rarely calls upon us at a time of our choosing, and yeah. and this this is basically what happens to our our high school characters. Specifically, <laughs> uh, we have the main character whose name is Sho Fukamachi. He's hanging out with his good buddy Tetsuro, and they hear basically a massive explosion and an object falls out of the sky from the direction of this explosion. I- Right away, right away. Mm-hmm. Didn't go with those names. I, I just was like, yep, I can't remember any of this. So right away, I named the main character Philippe, and his buddy was <laughs> named George. And that's just kind of how I kept things in line. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, nope, I don't know what his sister's name is, but that's George's sister. I can remember that. <laughs> I'm not and, even messing with you. I, I don't know their names. Mm-hmm. I, I've, I could read them and forget them right now. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, to your credit, this is the time where we do start to see this shift in, in anime dubbing, where we no longer like give the characters Western style names. This is something that was a tradition for the most part growing up um, with anime where yeah. like, I remember like watching Sailor Moon and you got, it was um, Serena is the main character instead of Usagi. But when you watch the newer versions of the dub that are out, she's Usagi now uh, yeah. because there is basically this, I don't want to say movement, but basically like this, like truth that like when you are changing the names of the characters you also end up like not because of the virtue of changing the name but western companies would typically greatly alter the story to yeah. make it something that like western audiences may may connect to easier or would basically get rid of cultural things that are would make sense in Japan but like don't make sense here in the states yeah. and oh, yeah. this is now in that you know turn the century era where it's like, all right, Funimation is basically going to stop doing that with its characters. We are keeping um, him as Sho Fukamachi, as opposed to when we look at even like the movie in the 1980s, Sho became Sean because it was close. And that's what we went with. I, I, I am joking a little bit. Mm-hmm. I could remember Sho and then Tetsuro for after enough exposure mm-hmm. to this. What I want to give them credit for in the beginning, though, is that you really don't have time to think about people's names. Mm -hmm. You don't even really have time to think about what's going on, other than the fact that there's this device that looks like an extreme Ghostbusters trap that's just kind of there. And we don't know what it does yet. And what I like about this compared to similar topics, maybe similar types of TV shows... And I'm not talking about similar anime or anime, whatever it's called. I don't know. I'm not I'm not familiar. <laughs> but rather than stretch this stuff out into some kind of mystery with what the device is and, and all mm-hmm. this stuff, they don't do that. Because I feel like a lot of TV shows would take this mystery item and mm-hmm. then stretch it out until the end of an episode. Oh, yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. That doesn't happen here. Uh a lot of violence and mm-hmm. a, a lot of transforming happens like right away in this in this show. Yeah, and unlike your other typical shonen anime, um, you do not have to have ninety percent of your episode be transfer like um, sequences, or oh, right, yeah. sorry, transformation sequences. Because basically, all he has, to, all show has to do after activating the Giver is just say Giver and the armor. And this in the anime. Um, they do have a little more of a super high tech feel to what's going on because the armor actually like shifts out of a pocket dimension and then goes over and encompasses show. Uh, whereas in, um, I think in, in the movie, like it literally somehow like a micro sizes itself and just goes into his literal back. But hmm. now on to the actual Giver itself, because like Mark mentioned, it started out as basically like, you know, this weird alien looking object, uh, looking like an extreme Ghostbusters trap. But after you make the either mistake or the, uh, I guess, jackpot of actually activating the unit, which is done by pressing like a, like a metal sphere that's in the middle of it, it actually wraps entirely around you, enveloping your body in itself. You become one with the armor as it biologically bonds to the host and to the host's credit it does have some pretty good perks because the armor one looks pretty bitchin like it's actually pretty cool i think it's got this like sleek yet simplistic design to it 
where it has a menagerie of like weapons to it however like they're not like grossly sticking out everywhere and they're mostly either hidden or very subtle in what they can do so if we look through what it is one its armor is incredibly durable basically bulletproof by normal human standards uh, can take quite a beating it does have a sweet little laser beam that comes out of a sphere on his forehead uh it has elbow blades and they vibrate at a very high frequency which I don't know how like doesn't actually make them actually fall off the the user, but they somehow stay rooted in and can slice through most things. Can, can we talk about how hard yeah. it must be to use those weapons? Because it, <laughs> it doesn't seem like whoever designed that went, I'm going to be using this weapon a lot. Mm -hmm. it, it feels like I'm only going to be using this to advance the story. Maybe I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't. It just didn't look right. It looked like he was trying to do like the Mac dance from "It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia." You know. Yeah. Like it's, it's it is one thing, one hiccup that of, of of the coolness of this armor that I really like. Like it it works in a very limited capacity of it being <laughs> on like the elbows. And it, it when we say it's yeah. on the elbows, it like goes upward and like up. So it's not. Yeah. They don't go forward facing. So you can't like use them as swords very easily. It's a very limited, like, past the person or weird stab you have to do with them yeah. to work. Um, yeah. It's, if, it's something it was, that... It was, like, made for a Mel Gibson movie at the very end when, like, he's fighting the bad guy <laughs> and you know, it's like, mm -hmm. any last words? And it's like, yeah. And then all of a sudden the elbow comes up. Elbow knife. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it, it, but to your point, mm -hmm. the rest of the, the Giver suit does look pretty cool. I, when I was thinking about this, I was trying to go through my head, and it's like, mm -hmm. what could have influenced this? And I think Transformers would be too easy. What I was thinking yep. about was Altered Beast, the, oh. the video game. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because when you see some of these other Givers or whatever the – what are, the, what are the suits called again? I can't remember. The, the uh, suits are all Givers. Yes. They're all Givers, okay. They're all Givers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, like the default enemy in this this property seems to be like these wolfman-looking oh, you know, werewolf things. Oh, the zoonoids. Things. Yes, we'll get to them a little more. Yep. We've, yeah. we've touched on them a little bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, the, they're they're obviously much different. Like, mm -hmm. you've, you've got, like, the 2010 Ford Escape design versus the 2012 <laughs> Look, yeah. one's, one's much sleeker and quieter than the other but, yeah and the other ooh, it's, it's yeah. basically very, a box on wheels very, very boxy yes <laughs> not winning any awards for being aerodynamic but mm -hmm. that yeah so right away that's the thing that i i wanted to point out was it took me a bit to realize that i'm watching like old tech versus new tech a little bit mm -hmm. of r&d action going on so you, you you have that build up. You know that someone has a deep yeah. dark secret, and they need the public to know. They get do. this tech in the right hands. <laughs> I mean, and the tech it's even better because um, one thing that is is a very Japanese um, thing that I've noticed, especially with like '80s mecha style things, is the last of his weaponry is he has what's called the Mega Smasher, and it's he's the pectoral armor pieces can open up and he has a massively huge laser blast that will level an entire forest and take out a chunk of a mountain if need be. Mm -hmm. uh, all of this is controlled, one, by the user if they know what they're doing, but what you actually do find out as the series goes along is the Giver itself isn't just armor, it is actually a living being. And it is controlled by what they just for lack of better terms, called the control metal. It is a giant sphere, on the not a giant sphere, but it is a prominent sphere on the forehead of the Giver. That's where it goes, which makes it, honestly, the a cool-looking aesthetic, but terrible design. Because it turns out, if that thing gets damaged, bad things happen to the person wearing the Giver unit. Um, like It can be something as simple as, like, wompy out of control muscle movements or death and that is prominently just right there and it's not honestly very durable from what you see in the series and it makes for probably one of the worst weaknesses ever you would think that okay if this was you know a an intelligently designed piece of like armor or weaponry why would you put the weakness right there exposed like without yeah. anything covering it yeah, it's a good. Mm -hmm. thing. Did nobody ever learn their lessons about the Death Star or any of these these mm -hmm. tropes? You know, you can't put the uh, the 
the absolute like RPG enemy mm-hmm. like weakness notification meter right there. I mean, yeah. Mm-hmm. Whew. No, wow. no, it doesn't does not make for good design. Uh, it's definitely like you know, there's like, like there's that little exhaust port that goes all the way down to the reactor. Maybe just set some plywood on top of that so no one can see it at the very least. Nope, nope, we're just gonna leave it there. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> Take some boxes out of storage and just put them there. I mean, it's it's mm-hmm. not rocket science. Good lord. No, no, no. Uh. But anyway, so we have uh, Sho and Tetsuro now thrust into this world. Uh, of Kronos uh, and them attempting to get back the Giver units, of which, like we mentioned, I believe, if not, uh, there were three of them at the start of the series. Uh, and at the what we have here, one was recovered immediately by Kronos, one is now in the hands of Sho, and the other is missing. But that mystery does get solved relatively quick. But anyway, more about this Kronos uh, that we had brought up. Like we said, it is a very, very old organization, very, very rich, very, very powerful, run by mostly monsters in the foot soldier level. Uh, And there is a hierarchy of these monsters. Like Mark said, you do have these big, bulky, bulging, beastly looking things. And some of them do have some cool things, like they've got shoulder mounted lasers. However, that requires a good amount of refinement. And they are slow and clunky compared to the Giver's Mega Smasher. Uh, and usually get dismantled pretty easily. Uh, yeah. But above them, you will eventually get introduced to what are called hyperzoanoids. And Mark, I don't think, did you get as far as the hyperzoanoids when you got in there? Now, were these the I'm blokes that had like the this these like sonic wave weaponry, mm-hmm. or is that is that what we're talking about right now? Yep, that's them. So they get a yeah. plethora of uh, basically. In, like just more incredible abilities where they can have sonic wave weaponry. Some of them have also have high frequency vibrating swords because that's just a fad um, in the 80s and 90s and came back again in the early 2000s. Uh, they can blow fire. They can use electricity. They can do a lot of things. They're just better than the standard model. Uh, they are still bulky, but, you know, just they've added some oomph to them to make them work. And at the head of it all, they have what are called the Zoolords, and they're the ones running all of Kronos. Uh, And I have to say, of the original iteration that I watched uh, and the bio-boosted armor, one thing that is an ongoing mystery is just what this company does to make its money. (laughs) They they never say that. They just say it's a rich, powerful company. It's like, are they disguised in pharmaceuticals? Are they disguised in electronics? What are they doing to have all this cash? Um, they never explain that. Well, they, they do focus on explaining a lot of really big things uh, as the show goes on. But this is one that always kind of was like a misstep for me. I'm like, all right, it's a big company. They're really strong. But why? This is where okay. we get kind of like villains who are villains for the sake of being villains here. At, at the same time, though, it's kind of like mm-hmm. uh, it's kind of like Team Rocket. It's kind of like the dude in Inspector Gadget. It's always petting the cat with the robot hand. Yeah, you know, like mm-hmm. you're you don't necessarily need to know where their dollars and cents tie to for them to, you know, mm-hmm. to be a legitimate evil corporation. I mean, True. it's it's not like we sat through and you know watched Cobra on GI Joe you know, fix their ledger so that it all looks properly kept from a bookkeeping standpoint. Yes, I mean, they have one book that says show to the IRS and another set says never show to yeah. the IRS. Yes, yeah, that's what Cobra yeah, does. Note, do not eat. Yeah, I mean, it, it, for, for me, that's what kind of helped me tether this to some other anime experiences that I've had where it's like, <laughs> okay, mm-hmm. they're clearly pointing me towards this person possibly being a bad guy. So I'm going to trust them on this. Yeah. Because yeah. not- notably in these, these anime, they, I, at least the, from this era, mm-hmm. you don't tend to get a whole lot of confusion or these like anti-hero sentiments where you, you've, you have to question who you support. So at least that was, no. that was nice of them. I that is welcoming that. here. Yeah, because we do stick with Sho pretty much consistently throughout the series. He disappears for a while. Um, I think you should really watch the series for that. Uh, as to figure out why show goes away he he disappears twice in the in this in this 26 episode span um but 
like Mark said, they don't keep you guessing too much here. They leave a few things where they are kind of uncreative with things. Like we said, we just have the Eagle organization out to get them and Pikachu and everyone else that they need. Um, it's actually monsters in the background. Uh, things look cool. We're no, there's no shortage, uh, shortage on gore. We, we have these characters that are there, and they all kind of fit into nice little archetype envelopes. Uh, you do have show as this naive character who kind of grows as the story goes on and that he is learning about the Giver and how to use it properly. And that's most of the mystery that we get in here. There is no, what is the Giver? It's like, no, no, no. Like, it's just, I have it. I don't know how to fucking use it, but I'm going to figure it out as I go along. Um, and then you get Tetsuro, who is the good old buddy, who's just here to support the best way he can, even though really he can't support very well. Um, you get his little sister, um, uh, Mitsumi, who is um, basically the archetype of this was Sho's crush growing up, a crush mm -hmm. on the, the, the friend's sister. Uh, and then you get Agito Makashima, who is the crush that the crush has. So basically you have the girlfriend and the guy she's telling you not to worry about, but mm -hmm. really we should worry about him because he's handsome as fuck. No, Very it, suave. Mm -hmm. for, for those of you that, that aren't following along with Joe and you followed my path instead. We're talking about <laughs> George's sister, who is, Phil and Philippe has a crush on, but she has a crush on someone else. Is that is that correct? Am I following the soap opera logic here? Yes, that is okay. how it goes. And what I would like to point out, if you, if you have watched this series versus like the 89 series, you will see there are some pretty stark differences between the two. This series, from what I have been told and what I have read up on, is a lot more faithful to like the way the manga unfolds. And hmm. so Agito Makashima in the original run, in the Bio Booster armor, was much more of this mysterious character. We don't know much about him. Is he good? Is he bad? He's handsome, but is he devilishly handsome? We don't know. And when we finally do get to figure something out, the series ran out of monies. But here, we do have that for a very faint fleeting moment over, is this guy good? Is this guy bad? And then that dispels actually pretty quick. And we figure out that Agito is just the more capable person in the series and mm -hmm. that he just kind of catches on to things a lot faster than anyone else and can basically problem solve at very, very high, high rates. And that's, that is his role throughout this series. Is it because he he's potentially augmented by something? <gasps> we am, am, am I picking up on the bre the breadcrumbs that this show yeah. is so haplessly leaving behind? Yes, that is the thing, is that it's not giving out much to figure out that Agito has found Giver Unit 3. Um, <laughs> and even so, so funly, uh, when he is, of course, we have the moment where he is kicking a lot of wholesale ass and the Zoonoids have to ask, who are you? And he says, call me Zeus, as in the Greek character who gets rid of Kronos and the other Titans. Yes. So we do have some fun play on words here and some fun things like that. And while we, while I did say that you've got characters that basically stay in their nice little archetype envelopes, uh, the kind of like story we're mostly presented with is it doesn't reinvent the wheel by any means, but at the same time, you know, your, your Corvette uses the same wheels that it's used for quite a while, and the newer ones are a lot of fun. From what I hear, I don't have one because they're mid-engined and very expensive. But yeah, well, it is a very, very enjoyable time here. I, I, the thing I was going to mention about this was that, once again, I, I'm first-time viewer trying to tie this to other things. So right away, I'm getting like Iron Man vibes because everybody's mm -hmm. trying to steal the technology, right? Mm -hmm. But the other thing that I was thinking about was... If if what you just told me was true, Joe, like if I can believe what you just told me about when this came out, that would mean that this predates Venom. It does. Mm -hmm. So it predates Venom by a couple years. Do you think that somebody watched this show, watched Guyver, and decided to come up with Venom? Because they're very, very similar augmentations. Yeah, uh, the idea that you have this symbiotic relationship between something foreign, which um, 
turns out to be quite alien, uh, having a bond with the host, and at many times overriding what the host wants to do or what the host is capable of doing. Uh, it is some very similar things with the Venom symbiote uh, that we have in Marvel. And while I cannot confirm that's happened, I can confirm that there were higher-ups in Marvel in the 60s and 70s and the 80s, notably one Stan the Man Lee, who mm. did enjoy quite a bit of Japanese programming and did attempt to bring Super Sentai to the United States before Haim Saban did. Difference? He was not laughed at, Haim Saban wasn't laughed out of his own room, out of his own company, like Stan Lee was when he brought up the idea. Um, yeah. So did someone at Marvel, like, watch Guyver and get the idea for Venom and put, like, a fun, like, Western twist on it? You know, I'm going to go the Bigfoot route and just say... You know, we I can't say no to that. Therefore, it could be a yes. <laughs> it's it's reminding me of <laughs> factor fiction right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> did, did, did we make it up? It's like yeah, total fabrication. Yeah. But in this case, it's like it's like no, this story mm -hmm. actually happened. And honestly, it does kind of feel like that's influencing something because it it just seems too similar to me. Oh yeah. For for this not to have that relevance, but at the same time, I did end up putting in quite a bit of research on this, Joe. Mm -hmm. So I, I made it a little bit further than you might think. Ooh. I made it into the territory that really started giving me Assassin's Creed vibes. Mm-hmm. Which is you have this precursor legacy kind of laying out there. There was this this higher form of being that creates mm -hmm. humanity which i know it's hasn't been popular it's also probably like a six thousand year old idea yeah <laughs> but that comes up here too <laughs> yeah it does and this is where like uh when mark was saying earlier that like the show doesn't have like a ton of mystery for you in what the giver is that is not there however as the story rolls on the characters do begin to wonder like you know where the hell did the thing come from uh, was it made by Kronos, and why do they want it back so bad? And you figure out more about, like, where the Zonoids came from, where the Giver came from. And, like Mark pointed out, there was this precursor race, and there are a bunch of answers that are given to questions that weren't asked very long ago in the series. They don't drag that out. It's very much, hey, could you tell me more about these Kronos folks? And someone just rolls up and says, yeah, let me tell you, pal. You're not going to fucking believe this, but this is what it's like. And some of the characters handle that information over basically humanity's past very well. Others do not. And there is some struggle there. I, I got to say, though, for the pacing of, a, of an anime or even a cartoon just in general, I know that I might have caused someone to have a, an aneurysm by calling a cartoon and anime the same thing. <laughs> but... This show does a good job with not really giving you a whole lot of time to stop and think. And when you start to rattle these little pieces off of, of mm -hmm. critical story, for me, Joe, you, you know that as soon as you ask me, hey, Mark, could you go watch roughly eight hours of anime? <laughs> and Oof. I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, no, but I did. I stuck with it. I fought yeah. through it. Or at least mm -hmm. I thought I was fighting through it because I didn't really have much downtime with this show. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 it's not a play on the main character's name either. But <laughs> the, 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 mm -hmm. the show actually does move remarkably fast. And I feel like they almost assume that we're just going to get what the guy who is right away. Like, they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're like you, don't, you don't need to get a whole bunch of story on this. We're going to give you enough exposition that's like two minutes across three episodes and you're done. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's it. Yep. So that's why I did actually kind of find this refreshing, mm -hmm. despite the fact that I have, you know, roughly three decades worth of sci-fi education under my belt. Mm -hmm. This would have felt new and brand new for, you know, the 1980s, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And this is something where when we look at the writer for the series, uh, Junke Takagami, um, if you don't recognize the name, you've definitely seen his stuff because he's worked on like the, I believe, the 80s and 90s versions of Ultraman. He worked on several Super Sentai series as a writer, Naruto, Pokemon, and even 
Dragon Ball GT. He worked on the one that not as many, not as, not as many people liked. <laughs> but again, for someone who did work in these shows that will drag out storylines, that will drag out transformation stuff, that will have all this basically the traditional Japanese like heavy posing and introducing themselves, that's something that doesn't happen in the show which is refreshing for Western audiences. You don't have the Giver like ripping over his chest and yelling Mega Smasher to have it go off. No, he uses it fast because he needs to use it fast. He doesn't summon things and have to say them as he's doing them. He just does them as he needs to do them. I noticed he didn't have to call a sword into every fight that he goes into rather than just bring the fight or the sword to the fight in the first place, Mm -hmm. which was really refreshing. I, I appreciated that. Yeah, very. And I think that refreshingness helps us get to where we are with this series today, because it's 17 years later. We're talking about it mostly because I, I kind of steered us in the direction for us to talk about it. But we've talked a lot about the standouts of the series, where you have a good pacing, it moves fast, the characters, while predictable, are still enjoyable, incredibly cool designs for the Giver of all the Zoonoids, and it is not short on action. And like other series that I, I do love, like Gundam, uh, it does find way to weave in some pretty tragic parts of the story where you have some very brutal things happen with Sho and the other characters, and you have to see them deal with that. And that's, that's part of the... It kind of, kind of it grounds you a little bit with the, uh, the struggle with the characters as in a very fantastic story. There is one funny part, though, where I think, isn't it like their school security guards basically get liquefied by, <laughs> by the Zoonoids? Yeah. And, and I, I know I keep calling him George, but George is like sitting there just screaming his name out. And I'm like, <laughs> did, did, they, did they mention this character yet? Like, I was like, I was like why, why are they so beat up over these guys <laughs> dying? Mm-hmm. And, and he's sitting there like, it, it's like the Austin Powers uh, scene where the dude's like having him stop the roller no! and you're like this <laughs> this this doesn't feel necessary right no. now but we're doing it mm-hmm. okay we're doing that yeah but and, like, maybe they're, they're we're mourning him they're mourning him like it's their parents i, I yeah. just didn't get that part i'll, I'll say this <laughs> I, when i was watching it first few episodes like i'm i'm like staring at it like this you know i'm like going all right let's take this in i got my wide eyes going but then as, as we kind of kept going, like my eyes start to squint a little bit more and I'm not getting tired, but I'm just like, mm-hmm. okay, what's happening here? That scene comes up. My eyes get wide again because I'm like, this is great. This this is this is hilarious to me for some reason. Mm-hmm. But I, I will say this, Joe. Yes, we are talking about it. And once again, no one asked and we listened. But <laughs> here's the thing though. Mm-hmm. I, since this is the first time watching it and you have introduced me to some anime along the way, the, the, I don't know why I keep calling it that. Sorry. <laughs> but <laughs> but, but the, so far, I think we've explored a decent amount of like good a- anime, right? Mm-hmm. Like it, like it, uh, clearly, there's a reason why I I don't say please don't ever make me watch this again, <laughs> or I or this might be a mm-hmm. solo show because because clearly yeah. that hasn't happened. Mm-mm. But th- this one, I think. The question I asked right away was, is this good anime? Like that, that was the thing. Because mm-hmm. I don't have a, I don't have a frame of reference for anything, Joe. I just don't. <laughs> so, so I'm sitting mm-hmm. here going like, all right, all right, all right. I've watched some good anime. I, I think I've, I, I might have watched some bad. Mm-hmm. It's hard for me to determine truly horrible. But like this for me felt like if it was done in like a, a traditional you know, just throw it out there like a Hanna-Barbera style of, of animation. Mm-hmm. Okay, maybe bad idea. Maybe bad. Yeah. <laughs> I went Flintstones with that. So <laughs> yeah, <it's good>. yeah. <laughs> yep, I, so found this, it. I found this mine in the, in the field here, <laughs> but I need you to put it on. <laughs> I don't know. That looks oh, dangerous. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know, Show Maybe you should put that away. <laughs> a bear comes running out. Hey, you better leave that alone. That's the zone rights are. They're all just yogi. <laughs> You better bring back that picnic basket unit. <laughs> All right. So, okay. So clearly, bad, re- bad, bad reference. <laughs> but I mean, if you if you put it into uh, let, let's say some of the early Marvel animation styles, right? Like mm-hmm. the animated Spider Man, the X Men series. If you put this plot and this kind of stuff into that animation style, I would have been all over it, mm-hmm. right? Like I probably would have been watching this if it was presented that way. And so at least from from a content standpoint, I could rationale go, 
okay, this this actually has something going for it, as opposed to like you said, charging for fifteen minutes and then stretching that into two episodes somehow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it is, I think, a wonderfully done series. And the only thing that I think really hurts it is that, like we had said, um, the guy for manga goes on for 32 volumes and is currently, according to Wikipedia, on hiatus and that they have stopped producing it with the intent to continue but haven't brought it back up yet. And because it is ongoing and this anime only lasted a year, it's only a third of the current story that's out there. So... Much like we did have with the the earlier OVA um, 12 episode series, even after 24 episodes, while it ends on a high note and a basically a conclusion conclusion point, which actually seems like, hey, this is where a season would end, that is where the series does stop. So you do <laughs> kind of have this idea or this this feeling that like you don't you don't get real closure because the organization's still out there, the heroes are turning the tide a little bit. We're gonna be able to like maybe take the fight to them for once uh for once here. And suddenly that's where it stops. And I know for some people, like I know like my brother's talked about this where he refuses to like give like Krypton a, a chance. Uh, the sci fi series that was about um Superman's grandfather on Krypton. He's mm -hmm. like, well it's dead after two seasons. Why am I gonna bother? I'm not gonna invest my time to that knowing that the story doesn't get completed. Um and if you're in that direction with this I would say try it anyway, because like Mark had a good time watching it. It's 26 episodes. They're 22 minutes each. It's not a huge time investment. And the time that you invest into it, I think it's a pretty fun ride. I mean, for, since it's free on YouTube, I didn't have to pay anything to, mm -hmm. to actually watch it, which was kind of nice because, I mean... I'm not trying to insult it, Joe. I wouldn't have paid money to watch this, but that's just because of personal <laughs> preferences, and you know mm -hmm. that. But, but yeah, it it is cool. It's out there to, to watch. It's like a, I don't know, maybe call it a forgotten part of, of like pop culture history because clearly somebody watched this. I mean, there there, people are clearly reading it overseas. Mm -hmm. So there there's some merit to this as an entertainment outlet. I mean, there, it wouldn't exist otherwise if it didn't. So from an animation standpoint, you guys, you, you, you put Akira in front of me and I watched Akira and I went, this looks pretty bitching for 1988. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately that's like the benchmark now that yeah. I compare all other <laughs> anime to. Mm -hmm. I did it again. All <laughs> other anime to is Akira, right? Mm -hmm. So I yeah. look at that and I go, this is, this is later. This is like, what is it? 14 years later. Mm -hmm. However long it was, later than ten that. years. Uh, well, I mean, it's longer than that because Akira came out. Akira came out, in, I think, eighty six. Then this I came out in two thousand eighty eight. Eighty eight. Okay, so I think eighty eight. Yep, and this came out in two thousand and five. Okay. Okay. So we're we're, we're a good amount of years away from that, right? Like we're mm -hmm. we're that's seventeen years away <laughs> from from this one, and. When I look at Akira and I look at this, I go, clearly Akira still had more money put oh, into yeah. it, mm -hmm. right? So there, I'm not going to dock points for that because I think Akira is a very unique, it's kind of off there by itself. Mm -hmm. So based on the stuff I've seen before, yeah, I, I think it is, it's entertaining enough. There's enough going on. I think I, I screwed myself up by naming the dude Philippe and, and the other dude George <laughs> because then other people refer to them throughout the episodes and I'm like, oh man. Did I, do I know who that is? Did I, did I, <laughs> it's like, it's like episodes four and five. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, that's Philippe. Okay. I got it now. I think I'm, I'm getting there mm -hmm. and, uh, don't do that. Don't do what I did. Cause no. I, I confused myself for like at least an hour and a half of viewing, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but yeah, for, for something that I think most people probably haven't seen. Yeah. It's definitely worth giving it a shot. At least check it out. Watch like an hour of it. Worst case scenario. You're still on YouTube and you can go find something else. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. And again, that's part of, I think, the, the advantage it has, advantages it have is being kind of like this obscure corner of anime in the West and that it has been around for a long time. It's had several shots at a go um, for us to view it. And still, not a lot of people have watched it because the series are relatively short. Um, like, this came out on DVD before it came out on any place to view. Like, 
like on like a station uh and the 89 one like obviously came out on vhs and that's what i remember like going and buying that after i'd watched the live action like movies on it but because of that and its relative obscurity it'll probably give you something new to look at it's very entertaining even if the story i mean i don't want to say unoriginal it does take a lot from other sources as far as things go but i think it does them all well it it feels unoriginal now Mm -hmm. that that, that's the big thing that i was trying to say earlier is that it feels unoriginal now because we've seen a lot of these concepts already we've been hammered with them multiple times some of them are stereotypical Mm -hmm. anime tropes when it comes to like how the main character is set up and how many times have you seen a reluctant hero in any property Mm -hmm. so but if if you put like I said, I, I can't believe I'm going back to what I originally stated here, which feels like <laughs> you know cinematic in a way. I really do think if this was one of the first things that I saw in this genre, this is probably what I would have been excited about the most because for the time it was doing some pretty unique things that would pop up later in other movies, other TV shows, other video games. Yeah, so now that it's gotten my my seal of, I mean, it's always had my seal of approval, and it's gotten Mark's um, Mark's acceptance. We're not going to say like riveting, uh, riveting review or like his 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 notary here, but Mark has say, accepted it. <laughs> have you mm-hmm. used a stamp and not stamped it all the way? It's kind of it's kind of where I'm at. Like it's lightly touched the page. You might mm-hmm. be able to make it out a little bit, but it's the the ink didn't fully commit. We'll put it yes. that way. And if I mean, like most, if you, like if this was a stamp that you had to lick, Mark would not lick most animes, but he would maybe put it under the faucet and slap it on. And in that note, we would like to thank you for listening to Digital Dissection. And as always, we appreciate all the Dissection crew does for us week after week. Your support goes a long way, and if you happened upon this show by accident, why not drop us a review or comment on the show? We also love hearing from you, so feel free to message us over at digitaldissectionpodcast at gmail.com. We welcome your ideas for future shows, and, well, you know, any other anime I can sneak in under Mark's nose. So, if you'd like to discuss that, or anything else, shoot us a line, and until next time... Keep on dissecting.